but we're coming off of a history of racially motivated slavery. That's not something we approve of. That's not something God approves of. That's not something we encourage, right? Racially motivated slavery is never anywhere acceptable or praised by God. Let's dig into today's topic, which is the topic of slavery, okay? What does the Bible have to say about slavery? Let's check it out. Now, there are several passages on slavery in the Bible. First, we're going to start in the Old Testament. Here is a passage in Exodus 21, 2 to 11. It says this, If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall be her master. And only the man shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and my children and do not want to go free, then the master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door of the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. If a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as a male servant does. If she does not please the master who has selected her for himself, he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has broken faith with her. If he selects her for his son, he must grant her the right of a daughter. So digging into the topic of slavery in the Bible, a lot of people say something like this. The Bible condones slavery, therefore the Bible's morality isn't good, it's an evil, immoral book, and therefore you ought not to follow it, okay? But we just read a passage here in Exodus 21 that talks about slavery and how you should go about it. Notice that it doesn't say anything about the goodness or badness of slavery. It doesn't say anything about the more moral good or evil of slavery. Instead, it just gives us examples for how we ought to think about slavery and how we ought to live in light of it. Okay. What is going on here? And this is what I'm going to suggest about many of the passages that we're reading here on slavery is just because the Bible talks about something and how to do it doesn't mean it is condoning that thing. Okay. There is a difference between what is prescriptive in the Bible and what is descriptive in the Bible, okay? Here we have a description of how they should go about enforcing slavery. But it doesn't mean it's prescriptive in that it's saying you must own slaves. No, the Bible is recognizing the existence of slavery at the time and is trying to teach God's people, Israel, how to do it well, okay? That is the first thing we need to understand. So that's the first thing I want you guys to recognize, okay? Just because slavery exists doesn't mean the Bible is condoning it, okay? Let's go to the next passage. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. They are to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. They are to work for you until the year of Jubilee. Then they and their children are to be released and they will go back to their own clans and to the property of their ancestors. Because the Israelites are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt, they must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. Okay, look, so your fellow Israelites you can't have as slaves, period. All right, God says not to do that. But they can, they're allowed to buy slaves from the nations surrounding them. Okay. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clans born in your country, and they will become your property. So here it is. Slavery, plain and simple. You can bequeath them to your children and inherited property, and you can make them slaves for life. But you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. If a foreigner residing among you becomes rich, and any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to the foreigner or to the member of the foreigner's clan, they retain the right of redemption after they have sold themselves. One of their relatives may redeem them. An uncle or a cousin or any blood relative in the clan may redeem them. Or if they prosper, they may redeem themselves. They and their buyer are to count the time from the year they sold themselves to the year of Jubilee. The price for the release is to be based on the rate paid to the hired worker. If many years remain, they must pay for the redemption for a larger share of the price paid for them. If only a few years remain until the year of Jubilee, they are to compute that and pay for their redemption accordingly. They are to be treated as workers hired from year to year. You must see to it that those to whom they owe service do not rule over them ruthlessly. 
Even if somebody is not redeemed in any of these ways, they and the children are to be released at the year of Jubilee. For the Israelites belong to me as servants. They are my servants whom I brought to you out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Another long verse on the topic, guys, but this is relevant. Two things. Note, first off, that somebody has the opportunity to sell themselves into slavery. This is not slavery in the sense that we know of it here in our modern day and age, but this is something referred to as indentured servitude. What is indentured servitude? Indentured servitude is the idea that I owe too much money to somebody. I owe them too much and I can't pay it. And I don't have the means to make that kind of money either. So here's what I'm going to do. Rather than, you know, being in a massive debt, I'm going to sell myself into slavery to them so that I can work for them. Okay. They'll give me food, shelter, and clothing. And I will work from, for them and my working for them. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. And living with them is going to pay off my debt that I owe to them. Does that make sense? This is much more in line with biblical slavery and how slavery was often practiced back then. Now, it's not the only kind. We're going to get to that in a second. But I want you guys to see this as well. Somebody had the opportunity to sell themselves into slavery. Note how different this is than slavery as it was practiced in America. America had racial slavery. It was based on race. And the people who were sold into slavery, they were not making any sort of profit or financial gain from their work. Instead, it was the people who kidnapped and stole them and sold them into slavery who made the profit or the gain. Okay? So that's a big difference. It was racially driven and racially motivated. And it wasn't indentured servitude, but it was actually forced upon these people, even though they didn't want to go into slavery. So that's an important difference between that slavery that we know about in America and the I don't slavery know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. that we are familiar with here in America. Um, the Bible, okay? We need to make that difference between those two types of slavery. Okay, so we went through that verse. The other thing I want you to see is that there's a year of Jubilee built in. There is a year of Jubilee built in, and what this year of Jubilee means is that once seven years were up, this will answer your question, Marin. once seven years were up, all the slaves were automatically released, okay? All the slaves were automatically released in the year of Jubilee, those who had sold themselves into slavery. And so what that means is there was a built-in aspect so that when you own slaves, they would have opportunity at their for their freedom every seven years, the year of Jubilee, right? And that's also very different than the racially driven, racially mo motivated slavery that we know about here in America, okay? So that's a very big difference as well. All right, let's go to our next verse, guys. Deuteronomy 15, 12 to, um, 12 to 18. If any of your people, Hebrew, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve for six years, in the seventh year, you must let them go free, the year of Jubilee. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God bless you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you, because he loves you and your family, and, you, and he is well off with you. Then take an awl and push it through his earlobe into the door, and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your female servant. Do not consider it hardship to set your servant free, because their service to you these six years has been worth twice as much as that of a hired hand. And the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. So look at that. Here's the year of ju Jubilee. Here's the freeing of the slaves that was to happen every seven years. And it's very, very clear that you are to let them go, but some of them might want to stay. Because again, you're providing food, shelter, and clothing. And if they want to say, stay, you pierce their ear as a sign that they are your servant or slave for life. Notice how different the Bible speaks of this topic of slavery than how we understand racially motivated slavery in America. These are very, very different things. Okay. So those are the three verses on slavery. Okay, now here's something I want you guys to see. There's a difference between description and prescription, which I already talked about. Just because something is permitted by God doesn't mean that it is God's ideal. Okay, here are several Old Testament passages, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And these passages actually demonstrate the fact that God had a very different understanding of slavery in the Old Testament. But here's the thing I want you to know. Does that mean God approves of slavery? It just needs to be done differently? 
No. Watch this, guys. Here's a very important biblical concept that Jesus brings out in the New Testament. Here we have, in Matthew 19, Jesus teaching on the topic of divorce. And I want you to see this, guys. This is a very important principle for understanding slavery in the Bible. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him there, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be un uh, united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus teaching on divorce says this. Nobody should get divorced for any reason. That's God's standard. That's his principle. That's what is righteous. To become one flesh, what God has joined together, let no man separate. That's God's ideal, okay? But the Pharisees bring up this. Why then did Moses command a man to give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Can you guys see how this principle applies? These people thought, I can get divorced for my wife for any reason. Why? Because Moses said, here's how you get divorced. So because Moses said, here's how you get divorced, God permits and allows us to divorce. And Jesus said, no, Moses gave you that command because you have hard hearts. Instead, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Now apply the same logic to slavery. Just because Moses writes to us how to practice slavery does not mean that God loves, commands, encourages, or approves of slavery. It's the exact same logic. Moses gave, told them how to do slavery, told them how to do divorce because of the hardness of their hearts. Moses told them how to practice slavery because of the hardness of their hearts. This is not something that is God's ideal, something he loves, his standard, or anything like that. Just because slavery existed and God told them how to do it in a proper or better way does not mean it is God's ideal or standard or he approves of it in any way, shape, or form. In the very same way that Moses wrote them how to get divorced because of the hardness of hearts, so too Moses wrote them how to practice slavery because the hardness of their hearts. It is not God's ideal and it is not what God would have for his people. And again, the slavery being practiced here in the Old Testament is not racial slavery. Instead, it is an economic slavery that had to do with indentured servitude. Now let's look at the New Testament. And this is the final thing I want to show you guys. There's a book in the New Testament called Philemon. Okay, it says right here, in this brief letter, Paul urged Philemon, owner of runaway slave Onesimus, to forgive his slave and accept him as a brother of Christ. Okay, so here's an important aspect, and this is the final thing I want to show you guys on the topic of slavery. Okay, here we have an example in the New Testament of a Christian slave owner owning a slave named Onesimus. And Paul writes this entire letter to tell him to accept his slave back and to not treat him harshly. And here's what I want you to see. If you read this, it's a short letter. If you read this, Paul never anywhere tells Philemon to release his slave and set him free. Instead, he urges him to treat him well and honorably, okay? This again goes to the reality of economic versus racial slavery. This slavery that was going on in the time period, even of the New Testament, wasn't racially driven. It was economic. This is how many economies functioned in this day and age. And Paul essentially tells Philemon to treat his slave well, okay? Now, we are in America, or many of you guys may not be in America, but we're coming off of a history of racially motivated slavery. That's not something we approve of. That's not something God approves of. That's not something we encourage, right? Racially motivated slavery is never anywhere acceptable or praised by God, okay? That's not the deal. Instead, we are to treat our slaves well in this context where you live with slavery. And so here's the final thing I want to say. Christianity is not primarily or first and foremost about 
righting the wrongs of this world or fixing all of the evils that are existing in mankind. Instead, Christianity, first and foremost, is about salvation of your heart, salvation of your soul before a right, righteous and holy God. Okay? Don't get me wrong. I think we ought to fight for injustice in our world today. It was largely a Christian movement that actually sought to abolish slavery, driven by people like William Wilberforce. So many tried to get rid of slavery from Christian principles. But that's not Christianity's first and foremost desire. Okay? And we can see this in Philemon as an example, because Paul never tells Philemon to release his slave. Instead, he tells him to treat him well. Because Christianity is not about overthrowing the current government, social standards, or economy, but instead about promoting salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? That's an important idea. Hey guys, you know the drill. Like and subscribe button if you like that content, because we're trying to put out new content daily for you right here on YouTube. So go ahead and hit those notifications, and we'll try to get it to you as soon as we can. Take care. God bless. Bye now.